Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's talk, The Travel Chain for the Visually Impaired. So last week and a session before, Frano did the tactile pedestrian crossings for the visually impaired. And Jeremy Opperman is going to talk to us today from a totally different point of view, from the point of view of the visually impaired. So Jeremy, over to you. We're going to let Jeremy do his talking first and then we will take questions later. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Belinda, and thank you for the opportunity. And good evening, all. It's uh, good to be back. Yeah, just a quick background. So my name is Jeremy Opperman. I'm, I'm an old disability consultant. I suppose you could call me a disability inclusion consultant. I've been doing this now for the last 21 years. What I've really been focusing on over those years is to shift paradigms, to try and inform society more about the reality of disability taking away the obsession we have and focusing on disabilities and actually looking at the barriers that we face, which is in fact what causes the lack of integration or inclusion. So in a, in a nutshell, if we focus on barriers rather than focusing on disability, you gain a far greater practical perspective because the obvious thing is if you remove more barriers in society, then people with disabilities can simply participate and, and integrate better. On the other hand, if you ignore barriers or you focus too much on disabilities and don't look at barriers, then sadly you won't be able to remove those barriers and disability will stay unintegrated. So that's really what we're talking about. Today I'm going to be taking you on a journey, which I call the travel chain. Well, I don't call it, it is called the travel chain. And we all experience it, every one of us. Utilize the travel chain some point in one's day whether you going from your home to the shops or going from your home to the work or your home to the airport, that is part of a travel chain. When you're visually impaired, there's a good chance that you're going to be using what's called NMT or non-motorized transport, which uh, another put another way is, is walking. And so you're going to be doing probably more walking than your average person. Now, average person is surgically attached to their cars. And so they leap into their cars and they drive somewhere and they leap out of their cars and they go into the shop or into the office or into the airport. But when you're visually impaired, the chances are, and if particularly if you're independent, very independent, you're going to walk somewhere, catch public transport perhaps, and then walk somewhere else. And then perhaps another public transport. Um, I'll end the session with a story of myself uh, in a particularly exciting travel chain. But for, for simplicity's sake and, and time, I'm only going to be talking about one short journey from my home to the nearest railway station. And the reason I did that is because we only have 50 odd minutes. Um, and there, as you'll notice, there's a great deal to speak about. So um, let's, without any further ado, let's, let's begin. So um, I'm going to be walking you through with pictures and a couple of diagrams. Um, and we might as well begin here. So what we have here is just a picture of me, hopefully from behind. Um, I've tried to keep a feel for that and most pictures of me from behind because uh, I have a perfect face for radio. But um, I am walking down my road. Now, immediately you can notice that I'm actually walking down the road. I'm physically walking down the road, not the pavement. And that is a theme you'll be noticing throughout this presentation, is how often we're forced to walk in the middle of the road as opposed to on the pavements. You'll notice that I'm walking with my guide dog, Ronnie. He's my third guide dog. I have been uh, visually impaired all my life and I've been using canes for the last 22 years and I've been using a guide dog for the last 13. Um, but here I am walking down the road and as you can see there's cars parked on either side and so I'm quite used to this. I've lived in this house for 18 years so I'm a fixture in the neighborhood and I walk down the road quite happily. The trouble is at the end of my road the road turns left and then goes on for about 100 meters um, or 200 meters even. And so guys coming from that direction burn down that road and then take a nice sharp groovy turn right and then they suddenly find me. And so we, we've had the occasional um, near miss, I have to say, but that's, that's an occupational hazard. So 
the what you're going to see here is a is a Google Earth map, and um, you'll see a little travel chain line going from my home down, heading south, my road, turning right 90 degrees, going due west, um, up Racecourse Road for about 100 meters, no, about 80 meters, 50 meters even, and then there's the big intersection. Um, and this is the intersection of Racecourse and Rosmead Avenue. So. Um, let me t hit you an X line and you'll see something interesting. So now we're focusing on the intersection itself. And here's our first obstacle. Now what I'm going to be doing today is I'm not just going to be pointing out lots and lots of obstacles. I'm actually going to be providing some solutions. I'm going to be pointing out where there are in fact regrettable obstacles. Um, I'm going to be illustrating things we could do differently. I'm going to be highlighting things we do very well. Uh, and in this intersection, there are a couple of excellent things. But as you can see, my daughter, um, who produced this particular slide for me, very kindly created a skull and crossbones at this particular area. So there we are on the, uh, on the northeastern corner of this intersection. And you'll notice there's a slipway now that's what's called um, a permanent slipway or a fluid slipway. So the cars, it's an, it's an uninterrupted slipway. So they, are, they don't have to go anywhere near the traffic signals at all. So it's an uninterrupted slipway. So they can drive um, from north to south on Rosmead Avenue and take, take a, a gentle left heading now east. Um, and they can go at a fair clip. And there's no robots, or there are no traffic signals or anything for them. They just go. They, or they are their own lane. The trouble is, if you look there, and heading, now you can see the compass, hopefully. So now I'm heading south. So I've got to cross that slipway in order to get to that island where there is now a traffic signal. You'll notice there are blue stars placed at each corner. That is where the traffic signal is. And so, or the robot, as we call it. So I've got to negotiate that slipway. Um, now, let me see if there's the next slide is the picture that I want. So now there's two pictures here and you can see it's actually showing me crossing that slipway um, from both directions, one going south and one going north. Um, now, let's just talk about something here. I'm going to dispel an age old myth here. So I'm crossing with a guide dog. Now, I know this area very well. I've lived within a kilometer of this intersection for the last 32 years. Every home, house I've owned has been within a kilometer and a half or so. I've lived in this very precise, 100 meters of this place for the last 18 years. So I'm intimately related to this intersection. Um, the, when we cross a road like this intersection, or no, not this intersection, the slipway, there's only one way you can do it if you're blind. Um, is by listening. Now, an intersection is a noisy thing. The other myth I want to uh, dispel here is that guide dogs don't actually look up and down the road, left and right and left again, and then look up at you and say, okay, boss, you can cross. It doesn't work like that. The guide dog patiently stands there at the corner or at the, at the sidewalk, and then, and then when I say go, he goes. Now, the theory is, is that if a vehicle should suddenly emerge in front of me, which I hadn't noticed, he will very, um, very bravely leap into me and knock me backwards so that I don't get hit by the car. I've never had occasion to test this theory and I'm not likely to. But the, the bottom line is, is that crossing slipways like this is very scary. Now, when I was younger and I could see a little better, it wasn't such a big deal. My vision has deteriorated over, the, over my entire life. I'm now in my late 50s and I'm at a point now where I have no usable vision other than light and dark. So it's become scarier and scarier. As, as I get older, my hearing has, has also deteriorated because I have a, a concomitant uh, condition with RP, which is called ushers. Many of us have, have a, a growing hearing loss, and I now use hearing aids. And um, noisy things don't please any blind person. But when you're losing your hearing, it's, it becomes um, 
It's especially frightening. So I had a long chat to my old friend, Karen Liebenberg, who's a well-known traffic engineer here in Cape Town yesterday, and I got her to look this intersection up on Google Earth. And she immediately saw the problem and she said, ah, you see what's missing here? And this is where I'm going to be providing some solutions. Um, what's missing here, of course, is that there's no yield sign on this intersection. Oh, sorry, on the slipway. Um, and there's no, what we used to call a pedestrian, a zebra crossing, now called a blocked crossing. And so there's, and there's not even parallel lines as to where you would cross. So the cars don't really see you until they see you, which could be quite late in the day. Um, and so what obviously needs to happen here is that there needs to be a yield sign inserted in the slipway as well as a parallel line blocked crossing so that it's very clear where pedestrians cross. Because if you look carefully at this intersection, there is absolutely no possible way to get to that triangular island without getting over that slipway. So let's get to the slipway. So let me get, so we've done that, we've managed, we've, we've successfully negotiated um, that slipway. And now we've got to that little island. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about traffic signals. And um, you've got two pictures there of traffic signals. We've got the one on the left, which is an older type, and the one on the right, which is the newer, more ubiquitous type that you'll see all over Cape Town and, and I'm assuming in many other places in the country. Uh, Cape Town definitely, by 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 a country mile, leads the country in 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 implementation of audio signals. Certainly, from a time point of view, we've had them for many years, um, and they are now SOP. They're literally standard operating procedure when an intersection is created. Audible traffic signals are employed. Now, the one on the left is the old-fashioned one, and when that when and this is funny enough, it's one of the very few still in use is this intersection using the old-fashioned one and what happens when you press that button um when the cycle changes the tone goes beep 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 beep, beep and then you know to cross um quite cleverly in the old days before they were replaced by the newer ones except for this intersection there was quite a clever quite a clever uh, trick is that it would go beep 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 on one direction and if you were going 90 degrees again and crossing over another leg of an intersection the tone would change to a sustained tone something like beep which gives you which tells you that you're not hearing the wrong intersection or the, the wrong buzzer and that that was actually quite um uh, what's the word um, pleasing to hear because you knew you were on the right track um, they don't use those anymore except for this intersection. This is literally one of the last existing intersections where the old tone is used. I've no idea why that is. Um, the right-hand one shows the newer. Now you'll notice this, this, this is a, a really sexy piece of kit, I've got to tell you this, this is really clever. So it's got several stunning um, aspects to it. So the first is you'll notice there's an embossed arrow just above the button. Now that embossed arrow points the direction you're going to be crossing, which is, we may sound kind of obvious, but when you don't see, and when curbs are often rounded and you can't see the tram lines on the road, the actual white lines on the road, it's actually very difficult to know which direction you're crossing sometimes. And so the arrow helps a lot to point you literally in the right direction. And so um, when you press that button, now this is not nearly as attractive a sound. It's a peculiar, uh, it's a peculiar sound that it makes. But before I go to that, I forgot to mention the the first very sexy aspect of this is that the pole has a noise of its own. I call it a, a tone generator or a pole locator. I don't know what its real name is, but it's it literally helps us locate the pole. So the pole goes doop 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 doop, doop perpetually. Um, until it's switched off. It, it will literally do that day in and day out. And of course, it's, they're always on a timer and they go off at about eight, nine o'clock at night. And so they don't say anything. But um, during the day, the pole will shout like that perpetually. And it's terrific because in a very, you know, in a, in a busy intersection or rather when there's lots of poles and things, it's actually quite hard for me or the dog even to identify which one is a pole to, to grab onto, which is our traffic signal. And so that pole helps us locate that pole tone helps us locate the pole. And it's, it's great, it really is. Um, 
There's another little um, trick with this thing is that it has three settings. So you can have a low setting uh, where it's much softer. You can have a high setting, which is obviously louder, um, which isn't uh, a great fan of, or well, rather uh, residents don't like it very much, you can imagine. And then there's a middle setting, which is automatic. And this is quite clever because if there's a great deal of noise, um, like lots of cars, motorbikes, buses, trucks, the noise increases of the pole. So the pole is, makes a louder noise and then the actual signal to cross is also louder. So it's a, a, a really, really, really clever innovation. Um, and as I say, this is now ubiquitous in Cape Town, just about everywhere. Um, and you, you cannot have an intersection without an audible traffic signal, which is great. Uh, there's an extremely responsive uh, Department of Transport subdivision which looks after these traffic signals and and they're great friends of mine now i've been working them for for 20 odd years and they they really responsive fixing things when they're broken and they put these things in when they tell people tell me they need them and it's terrific um so now you press the button and it's um it makes quite an unattractive squawk it sounds like a chicken being violated and it goes quack and then it goes um block 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 to cross the road and so it, that goes on for about five seconds and you can then cross over and i'll show you now here i'm actually crossing that intersection so i've pressed that button um, and i'm crossing the intersection and i'm going towards i'm going now that direction the first picture i'm going from uh, north to south now there's an interesting problem here. So I know this is supposed to focus on visually impaired issues, but here's an interesting problem. If you observe it, you'll notice that there's no drop curbs on these islands. There are funny enough, in the other picture you'll see there is in fact a drop curb going from uh, east to west, but from uh, south or north to south or south to north and on all the other sides of this large intersection, there are no drop curbs. So which means that if I was with some of my, and I have many, wheel, wheelchair using friends, they would literally not be able to come with me safely. They would have to circumnavigate that island in the traffic, perhaps. Okay, admittedly, if, if we press the button, there won't be any traffic, so they could technically go around, but how would they get up that island to press the button in the first place? So this is a, an interesting problem, and this is where the theory falls apart when it when it hits the practical road is that in theory we have what might be seen as a as a very accessible intersection until you get situations like this where you don't have drop curbs now i need to explain something about this intersection is that there are two protocols or two um, configurations in settings of traffic signal management and the one is called serial ped or serial pedestrian configuration and the other is parallel ped or parallel pedestrian configuration this intersection is a great example of what's called serial what serial means is that all four legs of the intersection stop so when you press that button the whole intersection comes to a standstill except for that slipway and so you could safely cross across a leg now, what I've learned from experience, having spent literally three decades crossing this thing, although these, these audible things have only been here for two decades, um, what I've realized is that that direction, that first picture there, is if I don't press that button and I allow the cars to go, they're going in the same direction as I am. So that's I'm crossing on what's called parallel. They can't turn left into that leg because that's what that slipway is for. And so what I tend to do is I cross over with the cars going to the um, southeast, uh, southeastern corner. Then I go to the right and I, then I press the button and then all four stop. And that's terrific because then I can cross completely safely and there's no risk of somebody from behind me coming and bumping into me. And so I cross the intersection. Um, so there's quite a lot there to take in, bearing in mind the parallel and the serial and the different traffic signals. Um, 
I want to introduce you to another intersection. I am straddled. My home is straddled by two intersections. So this is an intersection to the north of my home by another 100 meters. So I've literally, I'm equidistant in between these two intersections. Now, this, this intersection, I have every reason to use as well because the other one would take me to a pick and pay, a spa, three bottle stores, a park, the vet, and the station. This intersection takes me to my brother's home, about half a kilometer up the road, South African Guide Dog Association, who I have a lot of dealings with, they're about 100 meters away, uh, a chemist 700 meters away, a park about a kilometer away, audiologist about 650 meters away. So I've got every reason to use this intersection. Um, and I've got to tell you that you'd be safer walking in a Syrian street than crossing this intersection. This intersection puts hair on my chest every single time I cross it. It literally scares the hell out of me because it runs on what we call parallel. So when you press the button, not all four legs stop, only two of them. And so two, so the one leg goes. So um, let's have a look here. So I'm on the southeastern corner of this intersection now, and I need to cross over to the north. Um, where I would invariably, I might carry on down the road on that side of the road to get to guide dogs on one park. But if I want to go to the chemist, I've got to cross over again. So then crossing due west. So I press the button and you hear the, oh, did I mention about the vibration when I was telling you about the traffic signals? There, the, I forgot to mention that there's a, 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 a last wonderful innovation in these things is that it vibrates as well. So this is a real box of tricks, this thing. And the, it's a very useful thing for people who can't hear properly. In fact, the deaf blind were in mind when they, when they actually installed these things. So you can actually feel that little, I remember I showed you a picture of the intersection, uh, sorry, of the traffic signal. Um, and there was an embossed arrow. You can put your finger on that and it, it, it pulses to the, to the same beat as the pole. And then when it's time for the squawk, remember it's squawked and then it goes clock, 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 clock to cross. That vibration starts and it, it, it goes quite frantic. And so you know it's time for you to cross. So you're physically feeling it with your finger. Um, I find that extremely useful. I always hold that little um, arrow because um, you, intersections are noisy, noisy things. And this is a really busy little intersection. This is a bus route, so this, it's very common to have one or two or three buses all over the place. Um, and so I put my finger on that little arrow, and then when it shouts at me, I can walk. Now, you're taking your life in your hands. You're walking across, which is fine. Those guys that you're walking across are stopped. This, the eastern, that eastern uh, uh, leg is stopped, and I'm walking north, remember. But the guys now ahead of me, who are coming from the north, they're going south, some of them may want to turn east, which means they could in fact turn in front of me. Now the Karen yesterday told me about something and we can't decide whether this has been employed in this intersection or not, but it's called a phased, a pr a phased parallel um, configuration. What that means is that there's about a second that they give the pedestrian to start his march across the road and then the arrow to go left for those northern people, that northern leg, um, the arrow then kicks in. And the theory is, is that I'm halfway across, but the driver will see me because he's standing still. And the, and the idea is that he won't mow me down. And anyways, he's, he's coming from a standing start. So he, he's not likely to be moving too fast anywhere. Um, so, that's fine. It, it's it's nerve wracking, but we you you kind of get into the into the picture. You 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 take your life in your hands. You feel your 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 heart in your mouth as you're doing this thing. But I'll tell you where the dangerous one is. Is where I'm crossing. I'm back. Remember, I was standing on the southeast corner. Now this time I'm going to be crossing due west. Now this is where it's really dangerous. I press the button, and I remember what I said as the cycle. And it begins for me to cross. The, the thing goes squawk and then clock, 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 clock. I then step into that road. Remember, I'm going due west from that southeast corner. 
And where it gets scary is that the guys from behind, they're coming from the east. They're driving, they're breaking no rules at all. They see the arrow and they start turning. Now, when you're driving already and the arrow is green, you don't slow down. You're, you're driving at about 20, perhaps 15 at the minimum. And then you start turning and then you see the guy crossing. Now, you're indignant because you think you're breaking no rules. I'm certainly not breaking any rules because I've been told to cross. And I've got to tell you, I go to that corner maybe two or three times a year because I'm so frightened of crossing that leg. So that's, uh, that's just some insight into intersection usage. Right, so moving rapidly along. Now we've finished intersection, we've managed to negotiate them without being splattered across the road. And um, we're now going to be heading towards the station that I was telling you about. So now I'm heading into a little suburb. It's a, it's a little satellite suburb called Caulfield Village. It's a cute little middle-class suburb with, with completely overpriced houses. 30% um, more than my house is, and I'm only 300 meters from them. It's just a peculiar little enclave, of quite an attractive suburby thing. And so we start walking through that suburb to head towards the station. And we encounter obstacles such as you're seeing on the screen. So what you're seeing there is the first, the first um, obstacle is a gate. So what happens here in this particular instance, and there's a couple of them that I've noticed in, over the years, but the, here's a, a residence and he doesn't have an electric gate like many people do. He has two wire, wire and pipe gates, which he opens outward, which is already peculiar, into the pathway of the pavement. Now, I'm walking along with the dog, and uh, what happens is I can't see this happening. I don't see the gate there, right? But the dog stops. He certainly can't tell me. He can't say, like, boss, there's a gate there. He stops dead. Now, I don't know why he stopped. So what we do in guide dog parlance is say, okay, find the way, Ronnie, find the way. And he will. What he'll do is he'll get off the pavement now into the road. Now, that's a narrow road, but quite a busy road. And then, he'll, and then as I'm, he'll take me around the gate. But then he's very clever. He'll see that the other gate, the gate's mate, is also open. So he won't go back onto the pavement straight away. He'll walk up the road for the width of that driveway and then get back on the pavement. But if there's many cars in that road, it's quite disconcerting and not, not, not least of which is unsafe. Um, and I had a little incident with this gate um, a couple of years back when I first encountered it, in fact, is that I rather angrily shut the gate. I pushed it shut rather than go into a busy road. And as I slammed it shut, it hit a car that was reversing out of that driveway. Now, that, that man was irate and we nearly had a fist fight in the middle of the road. Um, he was, I suppose you could argue, rightly angry that I slammed a gate onto the back of his car because he was simply driving out of his driveway. But similarly, you might, you might, um, it, you might, it'd be interesting to hear your opinion about whether the gate should have been in the middle of the pathway of the pavement, a public pavement. Um, so I, when I'm out, I, I come across this gate often and I shut it routinely. Um, and I hope it annoys the hell out of him because he's almost certainly out and then wanting to come back in and impeded having to get out of his car now to open the gate. And I care less. Um, other obstacles there, you can see there's our, whenever uh, we have a pandemic in this country, uh, other than the virus, of the taking of or breaking of manhole covers. And you can see those two manhole covers there broken or gone. And then lastly, um, on the right hand side, I think. There's a peculiar feature, which is very rare. You don't see this very often. I've only seen this in rural towns. In rural towns, they're called jutes. Um, this is a particularly narrow little one. In, in the Boerland, you can see them. It's, a, it's an old rural thing where water would literally run down that um, at some point, and, and people could actually sluice it into their gardens. This is now, I'm talking many, many, many years ago. This is simply a runoff gutter, but it's in the road. That gutter is 100 mils, 120 mils wide and 100 millimeters deep. And it's flush with the road. 
And I've stepped into it several times when Ronnie has had to negotiate a dustbin or something, and I found my foot slipping into it. Um, you can imagine it would have fun with a little motorbike wheel, like an Uber Eats driver, those little motorbikes. Um, certainly a bicycle wheel, a pram wheel, skateboard, um, shoes, feet, obviously. And if anybody were to be using a wheelchair, certainly a wheelchair wheel. Uh, it is the most absurd thing. And it runs along hundreds of meters of this very, very um, prominent road called Third Avenue. Um, along the side, on one side only. It's the most extraordinary thing. More dangerous obstacles. Um, I, you know, there's, there's an interesting one on the left-hand picture. You'll see me tackling a, wrestling with a guy rope of a pole. I've never actually encountered that guy rope, and it happened while we were taking these pictures just the other day. And, and Ronnie doesn't normally get onto that pavement, um, but he did because there was a bit of an obstacle and we normally walk in the street because so many cars, I'll show you in the next slide, cars parking on the pavements. But in this particular instance, he hopped on the pavement. Um, and I, there was a, I think you can see a car there. So he's squeezing between the car and the wall. And I was following him. Now, he's obviously a lot shorter than I am. And so he doesn't see that guy rope looking directly at it as an obstacle to me. And so I clipped that thing with my shoulder and I got a hell of a fright because it's never happened to me before there. Um, but the, the scary thing next to slide, in the next picture I think you'll see is that there's a, there's, a, there's a really great hole because a manhole cover has been taken away just to the left of that car. And so this is why we tend to walk in the roads. Um, is also because of, of random street furniture. So street furniture are things like poles, um, electric boxes, uh, telephone boxes, uh, post boxes, light lamp posts, telephone posts, uh, street signs, stop signs, no parking signs, those guy ropes you saw. And these things are randomly put all over the shop. And so, you must remember something about a council. A council themselves don't do the work. They employ contractors to do work. And this is one of the greatest challenges that any municipality has is that the, count, the, the contractors themselves do the work. And the council might be quite educated about this stuff. Sadly, they're not. That's a, that's a, that's a ridiculous assumption because 90% of our municipalities in this country are pig ignorant when it comes to accessibility. Um, and anything benefiting non-motorized transport. And contractors are even worse. And so it's, it's completely standard, the complete norm to encounter street furniture being placed all over the place without any consideration for those that use the pavement. Um, I've got hundreds of pictures uh, that I've been collecting over the years of the most bizarre placement of street furniture. Um, as you can see with any of these pictures, it would be physically impossible for somebody with a pram or a walker or a wheelchair or in, in I mean, I, I'm, you know, I quite enjoy these, these things because it gives Ronnie a chance to practice his slalom and he weaves in and out of these things. Guide dogs actually quite enjoy the challenge because when they're trained, they, um, they, they often use these sorts of challenges to train them. Remember, when a guide dog is walking, he's on my left, and um, he has been taught now that his right shoulder is much wider. And so he's taught to, to measure. It's very clever, and they're, they're, they're extraordinarily accurate about it. And he's taught to measure the distance between an obstacle on his right to take into account that he's now got a, a, a man or a woman holding his harness walking next to him. And so they wonderfully... Um, adept at doing these kinds of slalom and they rather like the challenge um, and so, I mean it's fine but they're, they're tedious and there are some times when you literally have no choice but to step into the road and I really feel for women with prams and obviously everyone else um, who has to quite literally stop walking on the pavement get onto the road remember if you happen to be on the pavement and you're in a wheelchair the chances of finding a, a handy 
uh, drop curb at that area is zero, except for possibly a driveway. So you may even have to reverse to find a place to get onto the road in order to negotiate around these street furniture obstacles. And I mean, this is, this is just Harfield Village's drama, um, is that it's a tight little suburb with narrow streets, very little, many of the homes don't even have off street parking. Um, and so, because it's a very, very, that the homes are cheek by jowl and, and they often occupy the entire stand. And so the, the, the norm is for cars to park in the street and they're nervous of people. You know, if you have two cars parked in the street in a narrow street, there's almost no place for the cars to drive on. And so they go one up, one down, you know, two feet on the pavement and two feet on the, on the, on the road. Uh, and in some cases, even all four feet on the pavement which causes mayhem if you happen to want to walk in the pavement. I have long stopped trying. So in, in, in guide dog language, it's called country walking, where you tell the guide dog to walk on the road uh, because it's sometimes literally impossible to walk in the pavement for whatever reason. So walking through almost the entire journey through Southfield Village, I actually do in the road. I don't mind it really. I actually quite prefer it because... Um, as much as there are obstacles, there, there are cars and things, I can hear a car uh, from behind or ahead. Um, I'm just grateful I don't live in California where there are, you know, thousands and thousands of electric cars, uh, which I wouldn't hear, which, which might be some, uh, you might pause to think about that. So invariably we're gonna to come to a situation where you have to cross a road which is not signalized. So when you're crossing a road, which is, doesn't have a signal, traffic signal is called non-signalized. So, so we're just crossing a road. It could be anything, usually governed by stop signs or stop streets, sometimes a four-way stop street, sometimes just two. In this instance, I think you can see uh, this is crossing Second Avenue. So there's obviously no stop streets on the avenue itself because that's a clear road right through. Um, it's a busy road, a fast road. So they've put, over the years, they've, They've tried to curb that by putting sleeping policemen. You'll see there's a, as we call them sleeping policemen down here. I don't know if you do it up there in Joburg, but um, it's essentially a speed hump. It's far too benign, that speed hump. I've watched four by fours taking that thing at 100. So they're not, it's not that effective. Um, if you've got a little, a little car, then, they, then it's a bit better. But it's got chevrons on them, so it's quite clear to see. Now, I'm not going to use that as a pedestrian crossing because it's not, in my, it's not on my travel route. Um, but you can see him there on my right. He happens to be, he's not actually stopped by the way. He's actually driving. Um, um, but, uh, he was going very slowly. I could tell that he was going terribly slowly. So I'm crossing the road. So we, we tend to rely on driver's diligence. Um, and we, we, you know, often orientation mobility instructors and guide dog instructors get, get quite angry with us because we can be quite blase about crossing roads. We become very adept, even thus with, with slightly poorer hearing. I, I, I can tell when a car is far enough away for me to cross. I can tell how fast a car is going. I can often tell you the make of the car. Um, and so we get, we, get a bit, we get a bit blase about crossing roads. And so very often we, take, we, we think that the driver is going to see us. And as you can imagine, this sadly does end in tears somewhat. But whatever happens, we have no choice but to, to, uh, to you know, hopefully they will watch us. Um, so check the time. Right, moving on. And we are now at my destination. Um, where I've now reached the stairs of the station. This is a particularly unusual station. It's uh, literally only one of two in two stations in the entire network in Cape Town where the platform is in the middle of the two lines. Um, so there's literally only one platform. So you have to negotiate a subway to get to it. Now, obviously there are subways in every station, or almost every station. Um, in order to get from one platform to another. But in this instance, you've got to go use the subway to get to the only platform. Um, and you've got to get there to buy your ticket and you've got to get there to wait for your train. Um, 
And so I want to talk about a few things. So the first picture shows me approaching a T, which has got stairs going up to arms of the T, and then the stairs go down the longer part of the T underneath. And now I want to talk to you about steps. Um, I know you're dying to talk about the last picture, but I'll talk about steps in the first place. So steps, and this is something straight out of the, the rule book of you know, SANS 10 400, of course, um, which is the guideline Bible for accessibility. And what's, what's in there is a very, very clear uh, description of what steps, of how it should be, in, uh, be deployed. So steps should have markings on their noses, on the edges, on the, on, the, on the leading edges of the steps. You'll notice, you can see this very old fashioned, this is a terribly old area. So you can see the grooves being carved into the nose of the step. So that gives some sort of tactile purchase. However, um, it's gray, it's concrete. And so in the dusk or in the rain, you can't actually see those steps when going down them. And so what should happen is that those steps should be marked out with a quite a robust tactile strip perhaps, or if necessary, paint non-slip paint, so that it's very clearly marked which where are the actual noses of the, of the steps, but that hasn't been done, but there are tactile grooves carved into it, so that's kind of, um, you know, two out of three ain't bad kind of thing, um, but it would be better if, they were, if there was a visual, uh, um, strip so that we could see those steps and then you turn right and you would go normally underneath the subway so on this particular day which was only a week and a half ago we've had a lot of rain in Cape Town and I was I had every intention of getting on the platform and taking some pictures on the platform and perhaps even me catching a train we as you would know um, have had a problem with our trains um, we have a we have anarchy here literally and our trains are being burned almost weekly. And so there are less trains running. During COVID, of course, no trains ran at all. And then with ESCOM coming, uh, playing silly buggers recently, um, the trains didn't run either. And so it was a moot point whether I could have caught a train because I don't think they were running on this particular day. And so I was just about to walk down that stairway into the subway and the dog stopped and then my friend Linda who was behind me <laughs> looked over my shoulder and she said what 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 don't go there don't go there and it was full of water we estimate that that water is thigh deep so even if I'd <laughs> even if I'd wanted to catch a train I wouldn't have been able to um, and so I have absolutely nothing to say about that other than I couldn't possibly have caught that train uh, on that day and I have no idea whether that subway is siphoned out by now and I've never seen it so full of water and lastly my last slide really is um, just to reiterate something that that Freno said or Frano said last week about tactile paving I, I'm a great believer in these tactile paving particularly the directional paving um, Frano didn't really do justice to these things. Um, he's focused a lot on the blistered paving um, that that tell us that there's there's something happening, like the edge of a pavement, and they and the um, the drop curbs uh, employ blistered paving. Then the long arm of the L that some of you would have heard from Prano's talk last week is uh, directional. Now there are some consultants who don't like the directional paving, and they're talking nonsense. These directional pavers are excellent. Um, you can feel them much better than the blister paving through your shoes. You can find them if you use a cane. And in Cape Town, we, we use them um, very well. And they, I'm showing you there one example is that they always help you find an audible traffic signal. As you can see, the, the, the elbow of the, of the line of the tractile pavers are near that traffic light. So if I walk down the pavement, and I encounter the directional pavers which bisect the pavement, I know that at the end of that may very well be a traffic signal. Alternatively, if it isn't a traffic signal, it will be a crossing with a drop curb. Alternatively, if it isn't one of those two, it'll be a My City bus stop. And so every single My City bus stop in the Cape 
has these directional pavers to tell you where the My City bus stop is. It's terrific. And so it's an outstanding way of, um, uh, of, of, of pointing people in the right direction. And so you can literally find things. You can, you can literally find counters. The trouble is they're not used sufficiently. Um, they're not particularly well deployed logically. Uh, there are many applications that we could use even internally uh, where they could be better deployed. Um, to end, I want to just quickly tell you a, uh, a little story and then I'm up for questions. So the highlight of my travel chain experience came when I was 49 years old. And it was the very first time I was able to go from door to door independently to a client. And so I woke up in the morning. But I didn't do this often. I've done this about five times in, in those years. So I woke up very early in the morning and I walked this exact route I've just shown you to the station. I caught the train to Cape Town Station. I walked from Cape Town Station to the My City main terminus in Cape Town, which is not far. It's about 400 meters. I caught the My City to the airport. I caught the airplane to Joburg. I walked completely independently with my guide dog to Gaar Train. We used to use, I mean, I used to spend 10,000 Rand a year on Gaar Train. So he knew the route very well. So we walked from the arrivals to Gaar Train. We caught Gaar Train to Centurion. I walked out of Centurion Station and literally 200 meters away was my client, uh, Momentum. And they were my largest client at the time in 2012. And uh, so I did that, I did that weekly. Uh, not the whole travel train because as much as it, it gave me an enormous kick to be able to do that. And bearing in mind, I was 49 years old before I could do an independent travel train. The fact is that it was extremely stressful because you have to rely on public transport. Now, we're not a public transport country. We have an extremely poor public transport record. The, there was anxiety waiting for the train. Then there was anxiety waiting for the My City. And there's always anxiety for an airplane. But if the My City had been fractionally late and I hadn't built in enough of a buffer, or if the My City had just not run that day, which happens frequently, I would have missed my plane. And so as much as was, it was a huge rush to be able to do that travel chain, it wasn't something I did often. And as I said, I mean, in the hundreds of flights I did in those days, um, I only did this three or four times maximum. And that's my story. I'm open for questions. Jeremy, that was superb. Thank you so much. And the very interesting thing is that we take for granted so much about what happens with people and how they have to do things independently and what it means for them when they do do these things independently. There is one question that somebody just asked. Thank you, B. This person says, this is outside the talk, but can yeah. I ask how you are able to know what photos are on the slides while presenting? Well, I'm a professional presenter and I take the trouble to know where they are. Superb. And then um, another question. In the new stores, a lot of the stores are placing I little islands of goods all over the place and at funny angles. Do you find those or the older aisle system better to negotiate? No, the aisle system's easier. I, I, you know, it's in a, yeah. So those, those little aisles with displays, I've been known to, I've been known to perform some, some rather embarrassing feats with, with displays of, of things. Um, so I'm afraid, you know, when they, they I mean, it's, it's a retail trick. They place things in your way so that you'll notice them, uh, which of course is, it's obsolete for me. <laughs> okay. And then um, Frey knows here and he says, should there not be a difference between the tactiles leading to bus stops or pedestrian crossings? I think that would complicate the thing. Um, at Frano, just to educate you, the o and instructors, especially the older o and instructors, don't know about tactile paving anyway. So only now are blind people being taught. But first of all, 99.999% of the blind in this country have never seen an o and instructor. And so we're often self-taught. That means that 99% of blind people don't know what tactile pavings are, literally, because they're not taught. And there's not sufficient way of getting them to understand that. Only recently are o &M instructors now being taught and guide dog, even guide dog instructors are being taught about them. Um, 
so no, I wouldn't do that. I would I would keep that I would keep that exactly as it is. It, it's a, a perfectly decent. You know, that would just confuse the issue. Um, the next question says, where to start? Johannesburg is definitely far behind. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Give them a starting point. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's 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 a problem. Here's the thing. I've been dying to say this. And I've been saying it to them, to municipalities for years, but we have a culture in this country of the car. And so until such time that our officials, our municipal officials, and even our, our access friends, until such times that they, in fact, caught public transport and walked more, we will never have an appreciation of NMT. We will never have decent public transport until such time that civil servants use public transport. And I mean decision-making civil servants. That's never going to happen. And so as long as they leap into their cars and drive places, we're never going to have an, a, a decent, a safe and decent public transport infrastructure. Now, with the BRTs, there are, I mean, in Cape Town, we have MyCity, and there's no question that a few civil servants in the city use the MyCity infrastructure. It's true. But MyCity is, is a joke in the sense of it hardly covers anything close to the transport network. It goes to all of 10 places. And so 90% of the town isn't covered by it. So that, that isn't a solution. So yet it's, it'll, it's coming in and it's too slow. But the bottom line is until such time our civil service utilize public transport and NMT, we won't find that solution. I um, actually agree with you totally there. And you um, put me in mind of a place where I once walked um, that had two entrances 200 meters apart with and I worked there for quite a long time and people would drive from the one entrance to the other and they actually had a bus to take people who didn't yep. need to yep. it's, it's yep. less than half a block yeah yeah I think I think what, what what's lovely about Cape Town CBD and, and many places in Cape Town but particularly Cape Town CBD is that it's very safe it's probably the only city in the country where you can literally walk north to south, east to west, clear across. I mean, Freno and I spent an entire day. Remember Freno? Um, we spent an entire day five years ago, uh, and I was walking around him. I, I mean, I wore his little legs down to his knees, um, looking at, at various curb, cur uh, drop curbs and, and um, tactile paving. It was terrific. But you can literally walk across CBD Cape Town safely. Um, in the day. I mean, if you walk at it at two in the morning, you're looking for trouble. And so there is actually quite a lot of pedestrian traffic, and which is why, in fact, it's quite a, it's been fairly well deployed. Can I ask this one as well? Um, this person says, I have a service dog as well. My biggest struggle is getting access to shops and elsewhere, really. How do you manage and respond to people when they ask where Ronnie's service jacket is? Because unlike London or USA, etc., we don't use jackets that say that the guide dog or service dog, etc. We only have yeah. a harness. Well, that's not quite true. Um, actually, as a service dog owner, there is a little red jacket they should be using. It's true that for guide dogs, we don't use a jacket, but we have the harness. And the answer is, um, and I think I'm best equipped to answer this. Uh, um, yeah, and I'm speaking now, you know, as a guide dog owner, but I'm also speaking as a board member of, of Guide Dog Association. Is I, There are very rare times when I get angry. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fairly assertive. In fact, I'm very assertive. So the trick is to not get angry, but to be assertive and to be confident. And yes, you will always encounter this, this terrible, terrible problem of the security guard who prevents you from going in. There's been two very good legal rulings on this issue uh, in the last three years. And the first is with uh, Henry Herbst taking on Durbanville Hills Wine Estate, who wouldn't let him come in with his, with his guide dog. And that was a civil claim, and they lost 100,000 rand in that. 50,000 went to guide dogs, and 50,000 went to Henry. The second one was the South African guide dogs and one other versus the Department of Home Affairs. And that was an equality court. And this is important. It was an equality court case. And 
the Department of Home Affairs lost hands down. So it was, it was a no-brainer. And, and they were found to have discriminated against the person who wasn't allowed to go to home affairs. And so one must be assertive and use those kind of cases, if you know about them. Use those cases and say, I mean, I've said to people, that's interesting, let me, let me tell you about Durbanville Hills. And they changed their tune quite quickly. Um, so there's very rare time that you have to get frantically angry and you should never do that actually because it doesn't do you any good. Okay, the next question actually follows on this. Do you know of any reliable justice system to go to for legal support that will work well and handle issues of discrimination in justice yes. posed on the yeah. so, so there's there's a longish answer there. The first answer is don't bother with the Human Rights Commission. Okay, it's a waste of time simply because they're very, very busy and they are not they are an arbiter. They are not a they are not a, a justice seeking engine. They, their main thing is to arbitrate and to find a solution, which takes months and months and months. And they use lawyers and things. The far a more satisfactory way is to use the equality court system. Now, it's the best kept secret in this town. They've been around since 2002. This is their 20th year. There's 48 of them around the country. And you approach the clerk of the court, you explain your your challenge, your discrimination challenge. It's all about discrimination. And the clerk decides whether you have a case or not. You don't need a lawyer. You don't need money. You simply book a case. Uh, the defendant, oh, sorry, the, the accused, and this is where it's very interesting, is that it deviates from traditional law, is that the accused has to prove that he didn't discriminate against you. You don't have to prove that you discriminate, that, that he discriminated against you. They have to prove that they didn't. And that, that, puts, that puts an extraordinarily um, interesting spin on it. And I watched the, the case with Department of Home Affairs and Guide Dogs. I sat through the entire thing. And it was very interesting to watch how the judge was very adversarial towards counsel. And counsel complained and said, my Lord, I don't understand why you are so adversarial in this. And he said, because you don't understand how the Equality Court works. This is how it works. And so my advice to anybody is to begin to use the law in the way that it should be. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, then the next one actually follows directly on this again, and then I'll go to the other question. Um, I have taken checkers to court for claiming that I was pretending to be blind to steal. <laughs> it, was <completely, laughs> it was completely shocking how police and random people in the shop just jumped on the bandwagon. I won the case. Well, great. I'm glad you Terrific. did. I hope it was lots and lots of... Yes, me too. Me too. <laughs> lots and lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then a question that came earlier, but it's out of sequence. Do you think it is a reasonable request to municipalities to paint the bottom two meters of poles yellow? The gray bollards on many corners and lampposts are my worst barriers. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are several um, access professionals in the audience, I think. Well, I know of one at least. Yeah. And uh, bollards and poles street furniture of any description should be high contrast. Um, in fact, Freno probably knows chapter and verse. I'm not sure if Lisa's in the audience. Um, uh, Freno might, might you, you, he'd, he'd probably tell you chapter and verse there, but obstacles must be painted in a, uh, in a, in a, in a clearly tonal difference of the surrounding area. So yellow would be a great tonal difference from the darker gray of a tarmac, for instance. Uh, you're quite right. Bollards are the worst. And it's not unreasonable at all. It's legally expected. Um, Sans, Sans 10 400 is quite clear on it. And then the, the last comment comes from Frano again. Um, he said there's some really good proposals. He's referring back to the earlier conversation. They're really good proposals on two very similar but different layouts. To know the difference is easy. Many people have requested that. Quite right. No, indeed. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. 
You mean layouts of uh, tactile paving? Is that what That's you're referring right. to? Yes, yes. Yeah. I no, yeah. I, I would just caution on too many, too many variations. Bearing in mind that the majority of the people that these things are meant for don't know about them. Yes. Just bear that in mind. The majority of the blind, and this is a categorically accurate statement, statement literally don't know about them. So don't complicate things more. In China, for instance, they have enormous application of tactile paving, far too much. Ask any blind person who's traveled in China, and they, uh, <laughs> they, they it's too much. They go, they go random places. They don't go. They got different fields. They got different types, and it's, it's, a, it's. Eventually, you, you tune your brain out. So I would recommend you stay with the one type of directional paving and the one type of blistered paving, and you deploy them um, where absolutely needed, and and innovatively. And there's one thing that hasn't been discussed enough here is the deployment of internal tactile paving. Airports, for instance, at the main entrance to the information counter, from the information counter to the escalators, uh, they should all have tactile paving. There's a lot of application of internal tactile paving around the world. And then the earlier person has come back to us, the one um, with checkers. She says, unfortunately, I used criminal court using a legal aid attorney. I was arrested for their allegations. If you know how I can claim my case, please advise. I think we need to seek justice and expect inclusion. Well, if she is totally blind, um, or if she is blind at all, then that's a, that's a case of uh, discrimination, in which case the Equality Court would be a perfect case. I, I mean, that's a classic case. If she was arrested, then you could actually take the cops to the Equality Court because there was that is that's a heinous transgression. Yeah, so I would back back to and the act, by the way, that drives the Equality Court is the um, and, and Frana mentioned it last week as well. The Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act. Dreadful, dreadful long name. So Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act uh, drives the Equality Court. And then finally, Frano says, Jeremy, do you have more recommendations to get the word out on the SA developed pedestrian crossings and tactile layouts? Yes, um, I'd happily talk to him about that. I think, I think what needs to happen is that there needs, every blind agency in the country needs to highlight the benefit of tactile paving. It's tricky though, because invariably there isn't sufficient um, examples of them in the neighborhood. And so then it becomes a theoretical exercise. Until such time they're deployed more, then you've got something to show people. But if it's a theoretical exercise, then it's difficult for people to grasp. There's no point having, as, as has been done at Guide Dogs, where you've actually got some tactile paving used. Um, and so the trainers show people how to use it. But then when they when they hit they hit the streets, they never find the stuff again. And so they quickly forget it. So I think what we need to see is municipalities playing the game more, tactile paving being cleverly deployed. But definitely every agency in the country needs to spend a lot more effort on an MT, frankly. And, th and this, this, there's, a, there's a reason why there's a deficit here, simply because there are so few o &M instructors in the country. You know, there are only 40-something o &M instructors in the entire country yeah. um, <coughs> for a million blind people. Yeah. So there's a, you know, you can see the problem here. Uh, many places, you know, uh, literally are rural, so there's absolutely no application of tactile paving. They're never going to find it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, a, it's an imperfect problem, uh, which is very difficult to, to find a solution for. Yes, Fr Frano endorses what you said. He said, um, NTR1 should be the only layouts that are constructed to reduce doubt and confusion. Layouts in the whole of South Africa should be the same layouts. It does not seem that Cape Town is applying this. Yeah, well, Frano, do me the favor and email me or WhatsApp me because I've actually lost your contact details. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. Sorry, excuse me. Bless you. And that's the that's the end of the questions. Thank you. That was Excellent. absolutely amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Happy to. Happy I could oblige. Thank you.
What, what has really been wonderful with all these talks is that we've had such an interesting um, concept, um, diverse <laughs> from, from everybody, and it has really made, hopefully we're going to be able to network a lot more. So I know, Jeremy, that you told me that you're going to be leaving soon, but I think hopefully if we can continue using Zoom and be able to access and answer questions, that will be great. Absolutely. So Absolutely. if there are no more questions, um, the talk for next week, yeah? There's just Lisa Fento said, thanks, Jeff, phenomenal as always. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so next week's talk is by Dr. Kim Lewis. Um, Kim is a, um, is a GP who is visually impaired herself, and she is talking about dealing with anxiety during the COVID pandemic. So that will be our talk for next week, and we look forward to all of you attending again and please feel free to share these um these talks okay thank you very much belinda it was uh, it was terrific thank you thank you and then oh, well thank you so much evangelia said um thank you thank you thank you um and um, just said please to include her name, which I've now done because people don't always like it. Thank you, Abongili Zantini. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. See you next week. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.